Hello and welcome to another video. I'm really sorry for the lack of videos lately, that's because I've actually been really busy juggling three projects, and I have also made a bunch of progress on the Stargate project, so much so I might have to end up splitting the part 2 video into its own two parts, with hopefully the first part coming in in a few weeks. Now with this oven out of the way, I can crack on and assembly the gate in full and make a video on it. But first, I just want to show off this little side project I've just completed. A soldering reflow oven. While certainly not original and far from the first to be made, I've actually been wanting to make one of these for myself for quite some time, but unlike many that are made, I wanted to make this look like something that could have been off the shelf with all the components integrated inside the main chassis, where most other toaster ovens tend to have all the controls and some box on the outside of the oven. Soldering reflow ovens are an invaluable tool for any maker who does electronic stuff, and while I was putting this off for a while, I actually have another project I'm working on that has a really complex printed circuit board that also has a bunch of 0402 resistors on it, making it impossible for me to solder with a hot air reflow gun without all the components flying around. Now, I didn't want to spend much money on this, so I started looking for a second hand use toaster oven to work from, and while they were a few contenders, the price ended up being sniped way above what I wanted to pay. But luckily, I found this toaster oven on sale for new from a German eBay shop, and after shipping costs, it was just about the limit I wanted to pay for an oven, around £32. Now this oven wasn't totally perfect, it was rated for only 1000 watts, which is a little below what most other people's ovens are for reflowing. But from the measurements I got off the listing, it looked to be a great size. And it was quite nice to look at and felt like something I could work with. So I brought it, and after about a week it turned up. Even though I looked at the measurements, it still surprised me how small this looked in person. You certainly couldn't cook a pizza in this oven, but it was the perfect size for reflowing PCBs, so I was really happy. While I was waiting for this oven to be delivered, I figured out the basic parts I needed to get it working, that being a solid state relay for controlling the heating elements and a thermal couple for reading the temperature. I ordered them from China, which ended up being a waste of time and money, but I'll get to that in a bit. While I was waiting for everything, I used this time to start developing the software and the user interface. Anyone who knows me knows I am not a fan of NextGen displays. The NextGen company is a scummy bunch at best and borderline illegal at worst. And while I actually supported them in the past because of the concept of easy to make UIs appeal to me, the drop in quality of the hardware while keeping the prices up, as well as the bullying and the cover up tactics by the next gen forum staff has really made me want to avoid ever using them. However, even though the quality of the LCD panels really sucks, for this project I didn't want to have to use up one of my expensive EVE chips that are about £5 each, nor create a fully custom printed circuit board, and I still had a few next gen boards lying around gathering dust. I also didn't want to get bogged down creating the user interface completely in code, even though in the end I would have had a far higher quality display and user interface experience if I had used one of these FT810 EVE chips. So I ended up using a next gen display for this project. With the expected wait to be around two to three weeks for the solid state relay and the thermal couple to turn up from China, I pressed ahead with getting the bulk of the software done. This included getting all graphics assets and UI code down for the next gen display, as well as the interactive menu code and reflow cycle code for the Arduino Pro Mini I was going to use, based on the theory of how the heating elements were going to run. The first modification I did was to order and install some ceramic insulation wool used for insulating ovens. Why this oven didn't already have this I can only assume was to keep the costs down, but I wanted this area insulated, because I knew that the 1000 watts might be a bit slow for heating, but also to insulate and protect the electronics I was installing in the control area of the oven. I also used this time to start modifying the oven's control area, first cutting a hole and printing a frame for the display. And I also removed the branding and control markings with acetone, being sure to test a small unseen area first to see how well the enamel held up against the acetone. Luckily, the black enamel wasn't affected at all and only the white paint was removed. I was also able to find a main power switch similar to the one found on my laser cutter, which I could fit after widening the hole in the lower dial. And it even fit within the dial's resets perfectly, as well as go with the 80s futurism I was looking for. 
After about two weeks, I finished up as much as I could and carried on waiting. By this time, the pandemic was in full swing. The UK was in lockdown and all this had really hit delivery times from China. And by week four, I gave up waiting and decided to buy the parts locally at some uncomfortable extra cost. But at least I had the parts to actually test and adapt my code with. Or at least I would have if Amazon didn't mess up my delivery of the thermal couple for two weeks consecutively. But by this time, the one from China had actually turned up. This along with the trusted 16 amp solid state relay that I have used before, I was almost ready to start testing. I still needed a power supply for the Arduino. As others have done, I decided to use an off the shelf mains adapter. Because of the lockdown, I first tried getting one off Amazon, but after opening up and realizing just how dangerous this adapter was with its too narrow a spark gap between low and the high voltage areas and the shockingly close contacts between the live and the neutral, I had to return this to Amazon and make a complaint. I did manage to go to Homebase here in the UK, which was still open on a limited capacity, pick up a UK power plug as well as a cheap USB wall adapter. Unlike Amazon it seems, all walk-in shops must comply with electrical safety standards when selling mains powered goods. So while this adapter was likely made in China, it would have been vetted and passed safety checks before it would have been allowed to be put on the shelf. And indeed this adapter was far safer with a much better low to high voltage spark gap, but also a good wide gap between the live and the neutral mains. As well as having silicon insulation over the soldered contacts. To hack this into my oven, I cut off the mains prongs, soldered some mains cable into the contacts and wired it into my oven and epoxy glued the adapter case to the chassis of the oven. I wired everything up to the Arduino on the perforated prototype board and for simplicity, I cut up an old USB cable and used that to connect the Arduino to the power supply. And it took only a few tweaks of code to get it all working roughly as designed. For the most part, I felt at this stage that the project was done, bearing any minor tweaks to code, but I wasn't happy with the 1-2 to degrees per second heat up time, so I looked into ways of boosting the power. First, I tried to find more quartz heating elements that I could add, and I actually struggled to find anything. While I did find some, it was hard to match the size and the power of the ones I already had. But I was finding lots of high powered halogen heating elements on Amazon that I could easily fit into my oven. So I grabbed one of the ones that came with mountain brackets. And once they turned up, I began installing them. I had to drill a few holes to fit the mountain brackets and I used washers as spacers so the halogen element wasn't touching the shroud covering the original heating element. Wired it all in, double checked them after to make sure that my now 2400 watt of heating is still within the solid state relays power spec of 16 amps which it was with UK mains being 240 volts, 2400 watts equals 10 amps. I ran the heating cycle and it worked amazingly. I was now getting around 6 degrees a second of heating time. I was about to wrap up this project and get started to work on this video when my brother came in and complained that lights were flickering in the house. Uh. You see, we live out here in the countryside in the UK and the house was really old. Half of it is from the 1700s and half of it was built in the 1940s and most of the wiring is probably from around this time as well and we only had a 60 amp feed into the house. With all this, whenever something that uses a lot of power like a cooker or our electric shower, the lights will dim with the appliances in rush current and settle off a moment later. And with my oven, I was using a slow pulse width modulation method to power the heating elements on a 1 to 5 hertz cycle. That meant when the reflow cycle code was running, it was turning on a 2400 watt heating element over and over, which made the house lights flicker. So to save any future arguments with my brother, but more so to help protect the halogen heating element from being turned on and off again at such a slow rate, I decided I needed to swap out the solid state relay for a dimmer control circuit. With some advice from people on the Freenode Electronics IRC channel, I first looked into using one of these pot control dimmers, swapping out the pot dimmer with an LDR. But the EU has put a ban on cadmium being used in electronics, which has made finding suitable LDRs next to impossible. Soon after, I found another dimmer that used a digital readout and control. I realised right away this could be something I could mimic on the Arduino and control the dimmer unit directly. So I placed the order. I had some idea how this was going to work, 
but without testing the built-in faceplate on the oscilloscope, I couldn't be certain. Once I got the unit, I set it up right away and started probing the pins of the controller while it was running. And I was right. The demo was sending a zero crossing signal to the controller, and the controller was returning a timed pulse to trigger the dimmer's triac to activate at certain times in the AC cycle. So I began sorting out a simple octocoupler circuit to take over the controls with my Arduino. I spent the next day learning about how to set up Arduino timers, as I've not actually used the hardware timers before in any of my projects. I knew the theory of what I wanted to do. Have a timer that's latched onto the AC cycle by resetting and starting the timer whenever a zero signal was detected. This would both sync the timer to the AC cycle and give me a length of timer ticks of the AC half cycle. High to low, low to high. From there, I could then calculate the delay in ticks of when to turn on the triac of the AC cycle depending on the power percentage I wanted. The shorter the delay from the zero point would give me more power, the later the delay from the zero point would give me less power. This giving me a smooth control dimmer that shouldn't make the lights flicker. But it wasn't working. My timer code at this stage was mostly correct, outside of some later refinements. The problem was I was getting laggy zero crossing signals from the optocoupler. I'm not going to pretend I know mains electronics, I really don't. And as a warning to others, at one point when trying to come up with a filter for this signal, I managed to trip the power in the house. There was no real danger to me as this part of the dimmer was running around logic level, 5 to 7 volts on a noisy supply, from which I was running a pull up resistor to the zero signal line, the same as you would with digital signals. This caused the mains fault and tripped the RCD in the house. While no real harm was done, I was still reckless and I should have got a bit more help. Anyway, a user named Doc Scrutinized from the Freenode Electronics RC channel helped me and came up with a way of giving me a really good fast zero signal using two transistors and a couple of resistors. This simple circuit worked perfectly, giving me a really good tight timing signal, so a massive thank you to Doc Scrutinized for helping me with this. I really do appreciate it. Now with the working zero signal, I quickly discovered a little mistake of my timer code, as even with this much tighter signal, I still hadn't accounted for the fact this is reading a signal after the event of making that signal, meaning my timer would always be a little out of sync. This meant my code pulling the trigger signal low was overflowing into the next AC cycle by a few nanoseconds, keeping the triac in the dimmer activated, thus keeping the element on regardless of the dimming setting. I fixed this by adding some room for error, limiting how far up the detected AC cycle the triac could be triggered, though this did mean I had a cutoff point at around 5% power, maybe more than it needed to be, but it was never going to be used at this power level anyway. After some more tweaks to the reflow cycle code, switching from a slow PWM method over to the timer controlled method, and adding a ramp up and ramp down to the calculated power levels, my oven was pretty much done. I'm sure I can carry on tweaking this thing endlessly, and I may end up doing more tweaks in the future, both making some nicer looking and better organised code, but also some minor improvements internally. One issue I do have is the halogen. It works mostly by emitting infrared. This can cause some issues, and I may end up taking the halogen out and replacing it with more traditional heating elements later. But currently, with some early tests, the oven appears to be working as designed. Now let's go over how to use the oven and run a cycle. Turning the mains power switch turns the oven on and you get a nice splash screen. I wanted to go with that old 80s yellow CRT look. The Mangy Industries XZ50 Quartz Reflow Fabricator. I wanted to come up with a nice dystopian future Megacorp slogan, but building better worlds was already taken. Next the main menu loads with the default reflow profile, leaded and the profile graph is drawn. Pressing the preset button, here I can select between five presets, leaded, unleaded and three custom profiles. If I wanted to change any section of the profile, I simply had to press the category in the menu. A number keypad loads and I can select a number. And pressing enter, the main menu reloads with the updated field. Now I haven't programmed in protections or limits to what can be entered as only I'm going to be using it, so this might be one of those little tweaks I do a little down the line, but as long as I don't put in a stupid number or a number above 285, it should work. 
You can edit the heat up rate, the soak, the ramp up, the reflow, and the cycle will do its best to match whatever you input within reason. If I wanted to save the profile I just made, I go back to the presets menu and long press one of the custom profile buttons. And that profile is saved into the EEPROM and available to reload after the oven has been turned off. But for the sake of this demonstration, I'll just reload the leaded profile and run it and hit start. While I have covered most of the Window River black box to stop the light throwing out the camera's exposure, you can see that the halogen is now smoothly ramping between the dimmer percentages and not flashing so much. This should make the halogen last longer and stop the house lights from flickering, and so far I've not had any complaints from the family. As you can see with this profile, the heat up and soak manages to keep pretty accurate to the profile, as it does when reaching the reflow peak. Once the cycle is complete, an alarm sounds for 30 seconds telling me to open the door so the oven can cool down. While the alarm only lasts for around 30 seconds for sanity's sake, the warning lights continue till the oven reaches to at least 40 degrees, which is a far safer temperature to take the PCB. And as you can see, the solder has melted and pulled, even if I did just blob this paste on without using a stencil. So there we go, I now have a reflow oven that I can use for my various projects. Hopefully now you won't have to wait too long before there's an update to the Stargate, so keep an eye out. As always, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. And if you want to help support me, go check the link to my GoFundMe, where you can make a donation that will go towards the costs of my projects. Thank you again, stay safe and take care. Bye.